And we are live. Welcome, everyone. I'm Felix Davila, Event Programming Specialist at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you for joining us for this evening's special, Writers Live. Uh, Celeste Headley, speaking of race, why everybody needs to talk about racism and how to do it. Uh, reminder, all Pratt Library locations across the city are open at 50% capacity, so we hope to see you if you haven't been back to seeing us yet. Uh, please visit prattlibrary.org for more information. Uh, the Pratt Library is happy to be presenting this conversation as a part of the Baltimore Festival of Jewish Literature, a showcase of literary events reflecting important issues facing the Jewish community, featuring conversations with authors to inspire work towards justice and peace. Welcome to all who have joined as a part of the festival. We would also like to thank the Jewish Community Center of Greater Baltimore, the Gordon Center, Baltimore Hebrew Institution at Towson University, the Jewish Museum of Maryland, and the support of the Ivy Bookshop, Jay Moore, and the Associated. And now on to tonight's program. Celeste Headley is an award-winning journalist, professional speaker, and the author of We Need to Talk, How to Have Conversations That Matter, and Do Nothing, How to Break Away from Overworking, Overdoing, and Underliving. She's a regular guest host on NPR and American Public Media, and a highly sought consultant advising companies around the world on conversations about race, diversity, and inclusion. Her TED Talk, Sharing 10 Ways to Have a Better Conversation, has over 23 million total views. <clears throat> and she serves as an advisory board member for ProCon.org and the Listen First Project. Celeste is the recipient of the 2019 Media Changemaker Award, and she's also the proud granddaughter of composer William Grant Still, the Dean of African American Composers. Persia Nicole has been dominating the airways for over 10 years, starting in her native city, Washington, D.C., and is currently the midday host on 92.3 WERQ in one of the top radio markets, Baltimore, Maryland. Persia also does weekly entertainment on Baltimore's local news station, Fox 45. Persia has interviewed some of the biggest in the industry, Megan Thee Stallion, Misha Keys, Kendrick Lamar, Missy Elliott, and Brandy, just to name a few. And throughout her career, she's also worked with some of the biggest companies from Jeep, Avion Tequila, BET, Coca-Cola, Xfinity, and T-Mobile. Persia has also collaborated with Nordstrom to launch her bracelet line, Beads by Persia, and her biggest goal is to empower those who feel like they're powerless. So without further ado, please give me a warm welcome, or join me in giving a warm welcome to Celeste Headley and Persia Nicole. Yeah! <laughs> Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. I am super excited to be here for this conversation. Next to you, Celeste, this is going to be phenomenal. Uh, let's first kick this off with a health check. Can we do that? Like a health and mental check really quick? I think you're still muted. I was muted during that lovely introduction. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad you said that. I wish more people would do health checks. Yeah, I it's really important. Yeah, we don't do it enough. And I think it's always good when you when you see somebody, how you doing and how are you getting through this? So I just want to do that. I mean, for me, also being in media like yourself, it's like I have no choice but to read about the negative additions to this world. Um, you know, so I, I was trying to figure out how to get through a lot of different things. So the pandemic was a struggle. But for you, uh, how are some ways that you learned how to be more creative and uh, writing and just, you know, reporting from radio to just doing different uh, things on YouTube? How were you able to do that? Um, I have a really supportive pod around me. Um, I have a really close relationship with my son, with all my friends, and it. And I also live right across the street from Rock Creek Park in nice. uh, D.C. So I spend a lot of time walking my dog and talking to my neighbors and playing board games. <laughs> you know, I'm, I try to make sure that I schedule in as much off time and relaxation time where I'm not expecting myself to be productive. Um, that's really important that I'm not trying to leverage every moment of my day. Yeah. And just also having time to yourself just to kind of sit back, relax, read if you want to. Like I've exactly. got some poetry, just kind of like, you know, winding down, right? Yeah, absolutely. I garden. <laughs> I grow all, I grow a lot of my own herbs and yeah. and you know, like to cook and I make sure that I have these you know, I think a lot of people when they got into the pandemic and some people were stuck at home who yeah. people who were able to do remote work and they realized there was nothing in their house that was a hobby. Right. Right? Like everything in their house was connected to work somehow. So, <laughs> I'm not in that position. <laughs> right. I have lots of things I can do. 
Yeah, so that's always good to kind of get your mind off of different things. Uh, before we have this important, much needed conversation um, and convo, I, I think the execution of your first book, uh, We Need to Talk, and your second book, Do Nothing, are both very essential uh, because they both are the perfect segues, I feel like, in my opinion, uh, to speak in a race. Uh, can you break mm -hmm. down those two books as well? Yeah, We Need to Talk... Um was basically the you know the 70,000 word version of my my TED talk that mm -hmm. so many people have seen and I got to you know I got a full book to really dig into the research and explain um what it is that prevents us from having really good conversations um and how the the benefits of that how important it is to us as a species how important it is to our well-being but also how important it is to us as a society and the effects that the breakdown in conversations has had on us politically and even culturally um, and over the course of my research for that first book, I started to realize all the things that we were doing that we thought were helping us that were ending up to be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And that really led me directly into Do Nothing, um, which is about letting go of toxic productivity and how our obsession with working long hours and always being on brand and on message and leveraging everything, how that gets in the way of what's really important about life and how important those relationships are. I mean, think about how many times people decide not to go to a party. I don't have time. You know, I have right. too much work. Right. When really the work is, the work is tangential. <laughs> like the important part is those relationships. Um, so if your work is getting in the way in those relationships, the balance is off somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there in both of those books, there's a, there are sections on difference and bias, and the, you know, the the first one goes into difficult conversations, and it uses racism as an example. The second one, there's a whole chapter on whether or not women are more overworked than men. Spoiler alert, mm -hmm. they are. We're speaking in general. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, <laughs> this this third book really digs into it deeply because. There are very few conversations that are more difficult than a conversation about race and identity and justice and fairness. So here we are. Absolutely. Um, and I want to go really back to your TED Talk conversation because you had uh, 10 ways on how to have a better conversation. Uh, can we talk about what some of those ways are? How can we have that better conversation? I mean, number th one of the first ones is multitasking. Stop mm. trying to do it. <laughs> um, so if you're listening to this conversation and you also have 14 other tabs open and you keep switching back to your to check your eye, your inbox really quickly or looking at your phone, right. um, you're not able to do that. Most people think that they're able to multitask, but zero human beings can multitask. Mm. And all of the research that we have in recent years shows not only not only you're not able to do it, but it lowers your IQ when you try to multitask. And over time, it, it does real damage to your brain. Um, so, and we're not sure if that damage is reversible, but it definitely gets in the way of you having an actual conversation or retaining any information you're hearing. The, there are many parts of your brain, um, listening and speaking, use many of the same parts of the brain. You just cannot do them at the same time. Um, so being on a conference call and answering email, it's not going to work for you. So that's one example of them. Another one that is kind of relevant to speaking of race, and it's the one that I get the most pushback on, um, is where I say, don't equate your experience to other people's. And essentially, when people start to tell you about struggles they're having or something that's happened to them that's challenging, we have a tendency to tell them about a time when we had a similar experience, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody says, oh, my dog died, and you say, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you know, my dog died last year, right. and it was really hard, and it took me forever to get over with, get over it. And we think that we're expressing empathy, but that's not what we're doing. We're turning the camera on ourselves, mm -hmm. and we're pulling that attention away from them. And the other part is, is that you don't know how they feel. <laughs> you quite yeah. literally don't know how they feel. So those are just a couple things um, off the top of my head that that also are relevant to conversations about race. Yeah, and that's so weird because I think we all automatically say that. Oh, I understand how you feel. 
I'm so sorry. I understand that. And but in reality, you don't. Even if it's if it's a race, if you're telling somebody from a different nationality, oh, I understand. Yeah. You know, you know. But you don't because you don't know how they were raised. You don't know what was in their household and how they're feeling and in the world that we're in. Yeah, and you know, neurologically speaking, um, you know, when you experience trauma of any kind, any kind of pain, immediately your brain gets to work on softening the memory of it immediately that begins to happen which means that a year after year um after you've lost your dog you actually don't remember how hard that was mm. maybe you think you do but in point of fact your brain has sort of smeared vaseline over that lens because if we remembered the true pain of an experience for the rest of our life we would not be functional so our brain does that for us, for our safety and our protection. But again, that means you do not know what that feels like anymore. And so you need them to tell you. They need to be able to express what that is because you don't know. Hmm. Why didn't I have my pen and paper ready for these notes? I, I'm like, I'm like, hey, one more time. <laughs> This is, I mean, I'm really excited about this conversation. We're only 12 minutes in, and this is going to be phenomenal. We have until 8 o'clock. We're going to get into the Q&A in a little bit. So get your questions ready. Write down your notes, because we're going to get into that in a few. Um, but while writing your books, you were able to, you know, relate to the message uh, from different angles, a personal one and one through actual research as a journalist, uh, which gives real practical advice, right? Uh, so for conversations like we're having right now, and, um, you know, writing of speaking uh, of race and other books that you wrote as well. Uh, does, is that why you decided to go into journalism because of different deep conversations to have? No, um, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I, my master's degree, I, I'm a professional opera singer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I graduated from graduate school, I needed a day job. Every musician needs a day job, <laughs> unless you're Yo-Yo Ma. Um, and so I took a job as a weekend classical music host at my NPR station in, mm -hmm. in Flagstaff, Arizona, where I was. Um, and they began training me in how to do reporting because they didn't have anyone qualified to do their cultural reporting um and it just grew from there i actually had no interest in journalism whatsoever until i became a journalist and it ended up being something that not only i was good at but i really loved it um be and one of the reasons i really loved it is a couple things a well three things a um i got to be an, a perpetual student right i was paid to research things b i i as a public radio journalist, I do feel like I make the world a better place, or at least I try every day, um, which is really important to me, um, to do work that I think is making positive change. But also you do meet the most incredible people. And this is sort of where my TED TEDx talk came from, is the fact that I don't I think people underestimate how much talking to strangers can surprise you mm -hmm. and delight you. Like we don't we forget we see talking to strangers as something to dread, yeah. but in fact it is almost always enjoyable. Almost always. they People will surprise you. You have no idea looking at somebody. You know, and obviously this is true of like a racial stereotype or a gender stereotype that we think we know what people are like. But this is literally true of everything. Mm -hmm. That the way somebody's dressed, the way they're speaking, that does not tell you who they are. They will surprise you. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what's kept me in journalism. Those three things, that's what's kept me in journalism all these years. I love it. And, you know, I can relate. And I, I know this is saying, like, we just had this conversation, like, I understand. But I mean, I actually can relate to doing radio yeah. every day, getting on it and, you know, pressing on the on button on that mic gets me excited because you don't know who you're helping in that moment. You don't know who you're even talking to unless they call you. But it just makes it that much more better. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, as well as I do, that's it's, it's often not the most famous people that are the most interesting, right? Yeah. The famous people have been interviewed a billion times and they've given the answer to whatever that question was a million times. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you, then you, you interview some truck driver <laughs> and they have the most incredible stories, right? right. Um, it is. It's, it's, it's ever changing and ever surprising. Yeah. Um, as a radio personality and a journalist, um, as well, how do you approach talking about racism and racial injustice to your audience? Um, well, I I believe in uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, rather than pursue the the really kind of um, racist view that that objectivity is a thing that exists <laughs> because it does not exist. Instead, I believe that journalists should be transparent about where they're coming from and fair. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. After the um, murders at the, the church, I guess that would have been a few years ago now, yeah. that you may re recall we had a, a big national discussion about the Confederate flag. Right. Um, and I was hosting a show out of Atlanta and uh, we did a full week on the Confederate flag because you sh as you can imagine in Georgia, that is a contentious subject. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and before every show, I would say, listen, my family was owned on a plantation not far from where I'm sitting right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have strong feelings about the Confederate flag. Of course, I believe they shouldn't be flying on public grounds. Um, but I'm going to be fair. You know, we have people booked who are leaders of the Sons of the Conf Confederate Veterans and leaders of groups that very much support the flying of this flag. And so if you hear me being unfair, or if you hear me being inaccurate, call us, let us know. Mm -hmm. You know, my goal is to be fair, but I'm not gonna pretend that I don't have a point of view yeah. on this. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, you're human. And yeah. <laughs> that's what people have to recognize you as, I'm a human being. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, why would you think that a descendant of slaves, I, I mean, that's silly for me to pretend that I'm objective about the Confederate mm -hmm. flag. I mean, come on. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> There's Especially no eye roll know. big enough for that. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, your new book, Speaking of Race, Why Everyone Needs to Talk About Race and How to Do It is so essential. It is. And it's right on time. It couldn't have come at a better time. And I'm happy it came at this time. It's The title itself, is essential, okay? Without reading anything else, reading the title is essential. Um, it, something everybody needs to read. And in time where the name Karen has become the definition of someone that is racist, I think this is something everyone really needs to be a part of because maybe a Karen isn't racist or maybe she is and she doesn't know that she's racist, right? Um, how would you define a situation like that, seeing all the videos on social media, trending everywhere on YouTube of, uh, you know, this woman who is now telling people of a different race that they can't be in a park with their kids, they can't walk their dog here. What would that be to you? So there's a couple things, right? Um, let me introduce some cognitive dissonance here. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely the case that someone who's doing something that's essentially despicable mm -hmm. should be called out. We should never allow a racist, misogynist, anti-Semitic statement or action to stand. It should, there should always be pushback. But when you're in this situation, um, I mean, you said it yourself. The fact of the matter is that the, the vast majority of people, the most common way that we, that we interact with racism is because of unconscious bias. Very few of us will ever encounter true hostile racism. Mm -hmm. That's just the case. And so we're almost always talking about implicit bias, unconscious racism that people don't realize exists inside of their subconscious. In other words, there are so many of us, in fact, this is where I start the book, right? We are all biased. Mm -hmm. All of us believe that we are fair-minded and inclusive and anti-racist. We all believe that. We all think, almost everybody thinks that we are not sexist, for example but we all make assumptions about other people yeah. based on their perceived race. All of us do. Um, that's the pernicious nature of this bias. Beverly Daniel Tatum calls it the smog that that's in the air that we're all breathing in. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to avoid it. It's in the air that you breathe. And so you have to ask yourself in a situation like that when somebody's done something like that, um, what's my goal here? Is there any chance that I can point out um, the racism that's inherent in this person's actions or comments that's actually going to move the needle. Now, in these situations that we usually see on video, the answer is no, right? You're among the big group of people, the stakes are high, people's emotions are high. It's unlikely you're gonna be able to have a productive conversation in which I would probably just say, I would probably just use my star system of interrupting a microaggression. So the star system, every time you hear a microaggression, especially white people, especially white people, 
you should never let it stand. You do stop, tell, assist, restore. Hmm. So you stop that microaggression. You do, if you can, don't even let them finish the sentence. Then you're going to tell them that you disagree. I see it differently. That seems inappropriate to me. Uh, you know, that sounds racist to me. Then you're going to immediately move to assist. And you use the word assist because you don't want to lecture anybody. It has nothing to do with whether it's okay to lecture them or not, or whether they deserve it or not. It's that the lecture won't help. Mm -hmm. You will shut them down. So you're going to assist them by saying, you know, I have a different perspective on that. And it's because I know that blah, 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 whatever that may be. And then you're going to restore. And this means you're going to restore their humanity. You're going to say, you know, I know you try to be a good person and I know that you are try to be a, a fair person. And that's why it strikes me so weird that you said this thing or you did this thing. So that's a really easy way to interrupt microaggressions. You're not trying to say you're a Nazi, mm -hmm. right? Because that, that, I mean, what are you accomplishing? Not only that, but like, please stop calling everyone a Nazi, <laughs> right? Nazis were really horrible and we need to stop diluting how terrible that was mm -hmm. um but also you, you we have to start thinking about the goal of these interactions if our goal is to dunk on someone and get clicks on social media well then that's part of the problem that is part right. of the reason that we are here yeah and i agree do you feel like social media um has hurt or helped racism in america Oh, it's made it so much worse. I mean, and we know this scientifically. We mm -hmm. know that social media tends to polarize people. It pushes people to the extremes. Um, email makes people less cooperative, cooperative less compassionate, more yeah. likely to escalate conflict. Uh, we just, you know, it's nothing particularly inherent in social media itself. Social media absolutely has its uses mm -hmm. and is valuable in a number of ways. But for human interactions, it is not we simply have not evolved quickly enough to use social media as an authentic communication tool. You know, right. I asked one scientist um, whether the written text of any kind would, would equal um, the spoken voice in terms of effectiveness. And she said, you know, that's possible in five to 10,000 years. Mm. That's not how we're designed to communicate mm -hmm. with one another. And so you really have to stop using social media as a way to talk about something nuanced and personal like race and identity. Yeah. And even posting the videos. So now we know that this person is a Karen. So then what next? She loses her exactly. job, you know, has no job. OK, uh, maybe that moment she might have deserved to not have a job. Right. But then it didn't get solved. <laughs> we didn't solve anything. There's yep. nothing that was solved in that moment. So I love your, your steps that you have because in that moment, those steps will kind of help depending on how heated, of course, it is. Yeah, I mean, that's difficult when you're in those public situations. Anytime there's a group of people there, um, it's going to up the stakes. It's going to make it more likely that uh, someone will feel defensive. You know, yeah. for human beings, our social standing is the difference between life and death. It has always been so for human beings. We don't, humans don't survive alone, which means our, our survival depends on our belonging in a community. That's why evolutionarily speaking, belonging is our most inherent and urgent need after you cover water, food, and shelter. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it that way, when you are threatening someone's social standing, of course they will become defensive. Of course they will feel like they're being attacked because down in their amygdala, in their brains, they are being attacked. That's exactly what's happening to them. It's mm -hmm. unlikely in that particular situation you're gonna have a productive conversation. Right. But you could say to them, and I have done this before, you know, that was really inappropriate. You may not have realized what you were saying or what you were doing. Can I talk to you about this? And then step away. Now, look, I don't expect anybody to put themselves into a situation or try to have a conversation with someone in which their safety is threatened, whether that be physical or psychological. Mm -hmm. There's no point. Mm -hmm. At this that point, you walk away. But if there's a chance, if there's an opening in that door, I suggest you put, put your toe in there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we have a question here. Can Celeste provide a specific example of these star systems? I know you talked a little bit about it. They might have just uh, logged on when you were finished. 
Sure. So stop, tell, assist, restore. Let's say that um, you're in a meeting, uh, an office meeting, and somebody says, oh my God, I just wish we didn't have to do this diversity training. Why do we have to freaking learn about, I'm not racist. Why do we have to learn about racism every year? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a microaggression. Um, if you are, are uh, not understanding why this is a microaggression, um, it's because, well, let me explain how I would interrupt it. So I would stop before they continued. As soon as they said, why do we have to do diversity training? I would interrupt them immediately. And the way to interrupt, you just um, come up with these ideas in advance because I want you to do it quickly. I don't want you to stop and think about it. I want you to say something like, wait, what? Or whoa, or hold on. Or what did you say? Anything like that to just stop and interrupt them. Then you're going to tell them. That person would say, wow, that sounds inappropriate to me. That's all you have to say. You're telling them that you don't agree. Then you're going to assist them by explaining why you don't agree, which is that, you know, this company is still, the vast majority of our board members and our leadership is still white as a person of color. I think we all need to be working together to make this a more fair and equitable place. Diversity training to me is very important. Mm -hmm. And then I would restore their humanity and say, look, I, it's, it's possible you didn't realize how that came out. I know that you're, you're a great colleague and I've enjoyed working with you. I hope you don't mind me pointing this out. It's just because I don't understand, you know, why you would say that or if you even realized what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It takes one minute. Just to break it down. There or less. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that helps right there. Uh, let's talk about when writing, uh, speaking of race, what was the most difficult, if any, point of it for you? Writing the book, uh, the writing this book wrecked me. I'm going to be honest with you. I did not want to write it. Um, my When the George Floyd was murdered, my editor from Harper asked me if I'd be interested in writing a book like this, and I said no. Mm. Um you know, it's tough to write about race. It's tough to write in an honest and in-depth way about race. Yeah. Um, there were some things I didn't particularly want to share uh, with other people because they're still tender. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, also when you write about race, half of the people that read the book are going to hate it and disagree with you. Like that's just a given. Um, and, and also when you begin to write about race, it's, it's sometimes it happens that that's the only thing you're asked to talk about ever again. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I got to tell you, I was surprised at how much writing this book just gutted me. And uh, you know, when I finished, I spent a good two weeks, just not functional. I mean, yeah. I was wrecked. My neighbors were like, are you Oh, are you okay? Yeah. Um, there are some th stories I tell in this book that I literally have never told another person in my entire life. Wow. But I thought if I'm going to write this, I, I'm going to write it. Mm -hmm. um, and I eventually thought, you know, I, I've been offered a platform by a major publisher. Like what kind of coward would I be if I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna, that's too hard. Okay. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> Ask someone else. Um, you know, I think back to my my grandmother and my grandfather, my grandfather, you know, who, uh, you know, his mother had was born in a slave plantation in Georgia. And he ends up in Los Angeles, a black man trying to write classical music and meets this this Jewish concert pianist. And it's illegal for them to get married and they get married in Tijuana. And, you know, at that time people were dragging mixed race couples out of their homes and burning their houses down. And they had to put up a six foot fence to protect their children. And, and I thought to myself, like, what would they say to me after yeah. all they went through? If I were like, no, thank you. I don't want to write this important book. Right. So, so yeah, it was hard. It's, it's hard. You know, I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Talking about race doesn't always have to be hard. Mm -hmm. But being honest about it and sharing those kind of feelings, especially when sometimes people are not good faith actors in these conversations, especially when what often people are willing to do is just offer you, you know, um, talking points from some political party. Uh, it's a it's a risk. It's a risk worth taking, but it's always a risk. I'm happy you took that risk. I know it was some weeks after writing the book, you was 
under the covers going through it. I know that's pretty much it, <laughs> but we needed it. And, um, I know you talked about your grandfather and things that happened as well with him, but, uh, maybe something from your childhood that we could, uh, get from the book as a self-described light-skinned black Jew, um, you know, and what, what has happened throughout your, your life that also in addition helps you write this book? Um, well, it just means, I mean, you can see my skin color, right? I, people don't know what I am and they're always asking me, what are you? Which please don't ask people what they are. I'm not a table lamp. Um, (laughs) so, and you know, it's been difficult to find a community of my own. Um, so there's, that happens in a few ways. Um, number one, uh, even among black, the black community, uh, they sometimes have difficulty either recognizing or accepting a light skin as somebody as light skinned as I am. And I, I get that, mm-hmm. right? Like the darker skinned you are, the, the math is that that's probably the more that you have suffered. And mm-hmm. so I, I get that. Um, I certainly don't belong in the, the white community. I would never in a million years try to pass. Um, not that it's possible when your grandfather is famous as being an icon of black history, you're not going to go incognito. <laughs> right, right. Um, but, you know, it just means that I have spent my entire life with other people demanding to know uh, what are. my racial background is. Yeah. And also telling me that I'm wrong. Mm. If I, you know, if I said, you know, I, I remember one time I was at uh, church and um, I, somebody asked me and I said, I'm part black. And they said, don't ever say you're part black. Which part? Like the left part, you're like what? what I know. <laughs> I, yeah, and and I, it, you know, it's eventually it occurred to me, like, why do people feel like that's okay? Mm-hmm. You know, why is it okay to meet someone for the very first time, a stranger, and then ask them what race their family is, mm-hmm. but then to argue with them mm-hmm. over what you think they should say that their race is? Like, it's just the whole thing is so ridiculous. And then when you put into this this side this the light of the fact that race is imaginary, Mm -hmm. that it doesn't exist scientifically and biologically speaking, it becomes even more ridiculous. So, you know, and there's also surprise in people's faces when I go to, to appearances on behalf of my grandfather, um, people are like, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) you look Dominican. Right. right. Um, I get that all the time. (laughs) Um, It's just something I've been forced to talk about all my life. The other Part of that is that people, mostly white people, but not not only, say things to me that they would not say if they knew what my background was. Mm. Um, and then some of sometimes they get mad. They'll say something casually racist. I'll say, uh, "Excuse me, I'm black," yeah. and they'll say, "Well, why did you tell me?" <laughs> Why did I have to? <laughs> exactly. Do I need to be wearing a t-shirt or something? Oh, look. Um, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, look, if it was, if it, why would you think that's okay? It's only wrong if there's black people present. Like what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is something I've just been having, I've been forced to think about for a, as far back as I can possibly remember. Yeah. That's crazy. That brings me back to conversations having with people when they feel like it's okay to say something and they're like, well, I have a black friend. So that's supposed to be okay because you have a black friend. I just feel like it just makes no sense. Yeah. And I also start to wonder, you know, how much does your black friend like you? Because they're, they're letting you out in the world and say these things. Right. Um, I correct my friends. (laughs) I do. And um, because I, I, I know that I want people to correct me. Mm-hmm. I have said the wrong thing about race, about religion. I absolutely have. I try to be very honest about some of those mistakes in the book. Um, and I want people to feel the psychological standing and they want a few people to feel safe correcting me. Mm. Um, and we should all feel that way because we all say the wrong thing. Yeah. Of course we do. Of course we do. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of race is um, the book for people who have tried to debate and educate like we've been talking about and argue and then have gotten nowhere. 
Um, so it really is a book on how to get somewhere. Um, how can we get to that somewhere, to that place of debating and actually feeling like we've accomplished something after the conversation? I know you said, just mentioned, you know, correcting your friends and even have friends correcting you. That's a great example. What is something else uh, that you, you can give us? I think, first of all, we have to let go of the idea that we will feel a change. Your mm -hmm. goal is not to change anybody's mind. And I say that because you won't change anybody's mind. That just doesn't happen over the course of a conversation. People's deeply held beliefs and beliefs about race are almost always deeply held, take a lot of time uh, to change if they ever do. And they are uh, most of the time when we change our deeply held beliefs, it's through self-persuasion, not external persuasion. So stop going into these conversations expecting to convince someone or, or wear them down with the force of your arguments and statistics and data. It just is not going to work. Um, in which case, your import, the, the important part of your conversation is not to debate them since the debate will not help. It's to establish some kind of empathic bond. Empathic bonds do change people over the time. That's where you have the opportunity to actually let them change their own mind. <laughs> let me explain exactly how this works. So as I mentioned, everybody thinks that they're not racist, right? We have this idea of ourselves, this image of ourselves as a fair, inclusive, one of the good ones, right? We are a good person. And then somebody says, oh, you just said something racist. And we experience cognitive dissonance because this this perspective of us does not match the image we have of ourselves inside. Mm -hmm. Cognitive distance is very uncomfortable for the human brain. It's psychically painful and we strive to correct it as quickly as we possibly can. Now, when somebody says, oh, that thing you just said was racist, mm -hmm. we can do a couple different things in order to reestablish our sense of ourselves, right? We can either say, oh, crud there must be some unconscious bias lingering i i didn't even realize i obviously didn't think it through carefully thank you so much for pointing it out i'm going to work on this that's one way to reestablish your sense of yourself as a good person mm -hmm. the other way is to say that wasn't racist i was just joking you're overly sensitive and then of course we go right back to our sense of ourselves as a good person right right when you are having conversations with people um all you can do is try to make a little bit of nick in the armor. All you're trying to do is establish just a tiny little bit of that cognitive dissonance. It's a little bit like the sand irritating the pearl. That's mm. all you're trying to do. You're like that drip of water that over time will carve a little hole in the rock. So you're not looking for some dramatic change. You're just looking to plant a seed of dissent, just a mm. seed. And then you can walk away. And if, by the way, over the course of that conversation, you establish a bond them where you can really dig into what their thoughts are, why they believe the way they do, what's mm -hmm. behind all of it. Then you have learned something yourself. Then yeah. you have also come away with something valuable. That you can accomplish almost every time. Changing somebody's mind you will not be able to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, let's get into the holidays because, you know, Thanksgiving's right around the corner. Then we have Christmas. And I guess now we can, you know, spend it with our family, you know, big tables now. Um, good thing for some people, maybe not for others. Um, but, you know, when it comes to family, it's a lot of different uh, viewpoints when it comes to racism and politics and things like that. How would you say to approach a conversation with a relative at the dinner table this holiday season? when it comes to big situations like this? Like, how do you even approach a conversation to be not confrontational, but just more of a, okay, look, this is how it's gonna go. Yeah, so first of all, there's a lot of space between what pe most people do, which is avoid it completely or ignore the comment that they make um, and confronting them in an argument. Yeah. I wanna sort of reclaim that word confront. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I want people to start thinking of confronting prejudice as not letting it pass unchallenged, okay. right? When people, the, the, we model our behavior on what other people get away with. We model our ideas about what is 
all right, what is moral, what is acceptable, based on what gets us in trouble and what doesn't. Yeah. And especially in family groups, where you're literally teaching each other and learning from each other what your family cares about, what matters, and what is okay. If somebody makes some comment um, about the riots um, tearing up Baltimore or wherever, mm -hmm. you don't want that to stand as unchallenged. You want to make sure you at least say, you know, that's a that's a pretty biased and you know casually racist opinion. You know, mm -hmm. let's move on. Yeah, you can do that if all you have is five seconds. That's enough. Just confront every single one of them and then move on. Mm -hmm. Or if you can tolerate five minutes, give it five minutes and say, well, I found that to be inappropriate. Why, why would you say that? Why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. And engage them. Then when you get to the point where you can't tolerate it anymore, then you say, you know what? This is actually getting me worked up. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Let's change the subject. Right. I don't want people to avoid these conversations anymore. And I will, uh, you know, the thing of it is, your racist uncle Bob, right? Mm -hmm. um, who always says stupid things at the table. Mm -hmm. um, he, the person who is most likely to be able to change his behavior is somebody who he cares about and who looks like him. Mm, yeah. And that's you. And I get that you don't want to do it, but you have five minutes. And remember that when you don't confront your racist Uncle Bob, you're basically releasing him onto the world to spew that bile on all the people of color that he encounters day after day after day. I'm not making you responsible for his behavior. I'm not saying you're obligated. I'm just saying you have the power to make the change. Mm -hmm. Baby, you don't think you do, but you do. And if you do, if you have even a chance, a one in 10 chance of protecting all of those people of color and all those other people from that kind of um, hatred, even if it's casual hatred, yeah, you got you to gotta take that chance. Yeah, I love it. I, I like the, you know, talking to them individually, like one by one, so that it seems more of like a personal conversation directly to them versus like a all around table, like, hey, everybody, we're not doing this. You know, no, you just to them. And you want to make it as personal as possible. Yep. Yeah. Like you don't say, hey, black, you would really insult a black person. Or what would a black person think if they were here? No, this is about your upsetness, right? Mm -hmm. It's like when people, sometimes men will say things like, hey, don't swear, there's ladies present. Right. And I would think, oh, so saying that is okay when there's not ladies present? Like if it's right. wrong, it's wrong. So mm -hmm. own your objection. Mm -hmm. If they say something objectionable, say, hey, that bothers me, not the imaginary black people that you might invite to your family dinner. Right. It bothers me. Yeah. Um, so Brian's, I bought her audiobook and so far I'm really enjoying it. Yes. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> it's always cool to what audiobooks because as you're taking long drives, like you can kind of like listen to it and just like talking to you now like makes you more excited. And I'm sure for everybody else uh, watching as well to actually read the book or listen to the book. So I would, yeah. I would, like, a, I would like an audio and a paperback as well. I need <laughs> yeah, sometimes I like to listen to the audio book and have the paper copy so I can yeah. like, cause I just circle things in the margins and stuff. Yeah. I'm a circler. That's me, so. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> a highlighter and underliner. All of it. <laughs> Folding yeah. everything up to do it all. Um, yeah. Let's get into, and also while we're having this conversation, we could uh, start the Q&A as well so you guys can start asking some more questions or just comments, whatever you may have, and uh, I'll get them popped up on the screen or I'll ask Celeste as well. Uh, I want to get into one of your chapters. Um, I believe it's chapter one. Uh, is racist chapter one in your book? I think so. Who is a okay. racist? Yeah. Um, so to answer that, who is a racist? Uh, how do you know who a racist is? So that's a really good question. The, the definition of racism changes depending on what the, the context is, right? So if we're talking about systemic racism, that's when you get a definition like racism is prejudice plus power, mm. right? Um, but for my purposes, for a conversation, that doesn't work only because that only makes someone racist and biased if they're actually um, taking action and doing things to sort of hurt other people, right? Or advantage their own race. 
For my purposes, I was more, I'm more interested in the unconscious bias that all of us have. I want everyone to become aware of their own unconscious biases because that's going to A, make you more forgiving of your own mistakes to understand that you will make mistakes and that reduces the fear. Mm. But also you're more forgiving of other people's mistakes. We need to lower the temperature on these conversations, right? Mm. We need to make it so that people aren't afraid that their entire life is at stake. Their entire reputation is at stake every time they talk about race. And again, I want to be totally clear. I'm not talking about somebody that uh, truly damages someone else. Someone who takes is an active racist or a hostile racist. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the most common form of racism that we all encounter, which is it's known as unconscious bias or casual racism. It's a bad way to say it because casual racism is extremely damaging. Yeah. <laughs> not very casual. I'm just casually racist. No, no. no I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just casually not hiring any, you know, Latinx people. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, we live, and, you know, and one of the things that I I talk about in this particular context is the, the famous... A baby doll experiment that the Clarks, the psychologist, the Clarks carried out that led to the, the Supreme Court decision of Brown v. Board of Education. And for this um, experiment, they w presented a large number of black children with two dolls. They were exactly the same, except one was white and one was black. And they would say, okay, which one is the good doll? And they would point to the white doll. Which one's the pretty doll? And they'd point to the, the white doll. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say, okay, which one looks like you? And they would point to the black doll. And one little boy, they said, uh, which one looks like you? And he said, that one, that's an N-word. Mm. And so is the little boy racist? Yes. He has absolutely fed on and mm. adopted the racist stories that this country told him. Yeah. Is he as bad as... David Duke? Of course not. He's a victim of racism. Someone else is a perpetrator, but he yeah. is racist. Mm -hmm. This is sort of what we all have to accept, how, how vulnerable we are to make these assumptions about other people and about ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how long it takes so many of us who have kinky hair or a or, or, or African-American features, or for my Asian-American friends who have narrow eyes, how, how long it takes us to accept that we're still beautiful. Yeah. That's a racist assumption that makes us think that those that's not beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's lingering in all of us. And, and we are, we're not honest with ourselves about race. I mean, again, I'm not, this is, there's no moral equivalency here. I'm not, we're not talking about systems. We're not talking about that. I'm talking about in relationships between people. We can at least understand how inundated we are with these racist images and racist assumptions and the people that we should trust telling us lies based on race. Mm -hmm. It makes us all vulnerable to it. Yeah. And, and it doesn't help. Like we talked about earlier with social media, because social media says you're supposed to look like this. If you're a black woman, your hair exactly. should be straight and long and this and that. Like, yep. you know, so it, it just it doesn't help for our youth that's growing up now in this generation that we're in. And, and it's sad. Like you said, like, you know, you are racist if you feel like you should be looking a certain way and not this way because that person's uglier because they're darker or their hair is kinkier. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I mean, look at uh, all of the, I mean, many people are aware of how widely popular uh, skin lightening creams are in Africa, in many African countries. Yeah, yeah. Like, that breaks my heart. But it is the result of someone growing up and being told these racist lies about others and about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we need to be honest with ourselves about, you know, I am writing in the midst right now of writing a very short, extremely short, um, sort of an extension to speaking of race, which is about speaking about sexism. And right. in preparing for that, I went to the, the Harvard site. There's an, a, a site where they have implicit association tests. It's the Implicit Association Project. And I went and took both of the tests that were related to gender. And boy, am I sexist. <laughs> 
Mm. I mean, it's horrifying. I consider myself to be an incredibly outspoken feminist, Mm -hmm. but something inside me is more likely to associate a man with a job and a woman with a home. Wow. And it's living inside me. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do this work, I highly suggest you go to the Harvard Implicit Association test and take a test. It's 100% anonymous. That's for you to know. But to become aware of these associations, make they have ones that are focused on transgender. There are some that are focused on religion, ageism. Um, but we all have these biases living in our subconscious and we need to be each other's checks and balances. Mm. I need other people to correct me when I've said something stupid. My right. son corrects me all the time on gender. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I'll say he, blah, you know, he, the doctor, blah, 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 he goes, and he'd say, you know, mom, there's they. There are mm-hmm. gender neutral pronouns. You don't know yeah. if it's a he or a she. Yeah. Um, he corrects me all the time. And we need that. We need to be each other's culture of correction to make it okay to be wrong, to make it okay to learn from our mistakes. And uh, shout out to Kia who keeps popping up. And I love the hand clap and everything because, because also throughout every day, we need someone like her, like, you know, like they, like them to show us that we are doing great as people and to show you that the work that you're putting in is phenomenal. And it, it like I said earlier, and it's right on time. So um, let's get into chapter two, I believe, and it's titled uh, The Science. Uh, yeah. Uh, what does science say about racism? It, there's no such thing. <laughs> you know, scientists, so a bunch of racist scientists spent a long time trying to prove that you could do blood tests or measure brains or cranial measurements and and know who was, um, I'm going to use an, uh, an unacceptable term here, the Negroid race, right? And the, uh, the whole purpose of that was to have some kind of ju- scientific justification for treating some people differently than others. They wanted to justify their racism, right? Um, But every single one of those scientific studies has been thoroughly debunked. It is, race simply does not exist. You know, do you remember a few years back when there was this huge scandal, pardon me for using air quotes, because, it turned out Michelle Obama had white people in her family tree. Do you remember that? This was yes. so shocking. Yes. What black person was shocked by that? I None. mean, even the same thing with Barack Obama. Exactly. Because, Come on. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Why you know, I'm, I know I'm essentially the same mixture as uh, for the most part as Sally Hemings. Mm-hmm. Sally Hemings had one black grandparent um, which is the same as me. And, and we, we don't think of her that way, right? When people picture Sally Hemings, they picture like, you know, a dark skinned slave woman. Yep. We forget how intertwined all of us have been all over the world. There is no biological race. Race is only real because racism is real. Yeah. Racism means that I will be treated, that I, even with my light skin, would have been subject to Jim Crow laws, that my son would be subject to Jim Crow laws. Mm. And that makes my race real. That's what makes it real, Mm -hmm. is because race, my perceived race, dictates what kind of loan I'm gonna get on my house, where I'm allowed to live, where my kids can go to school, what kind of healthcare I get, whether I get the surgery I need or the medicine that I need or I don't. Yep. It dictates almost every part of my life and your life and everybody's life. That's yeah. why race is real, not because there's some gene. Yeah, and not because science says so. We don't need no. science to tell us that there are racists in this world. We don't need science to tell us that we can't get certain things because of our skin color. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Um, I love Sally herself, her story. Yeah, Hensel, her story. Yeah, amen. Oh, yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> Uh, You know, I want to quote, there's a quote that I put in the book, which is from the geneticist Adam Rutherford. And he said, um, you are descended from multitudes from all around the world, from people you think you know, and from more you know nothing about. You will have no meaningful genetic link to many of them. These are the facts of biology. For humans, there are no pure bloods, only mongrels enriched by the blood of multitudes. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. That's what science tells us. Mm. 
I don't understand. Yeah. You know, I but the perfect and the best way to describe the book is something that I keep on saying is essential because you know they don't teach racism in school anymore. Like, you know, they bypass all of these things that you're talking about in your book. They don't teach kids how to deal with things when they go on a job interview, when they are being racially profiled, you know, when you're stopped by a police officer, how to deal with a Karen. Like, you know, so your book is that book that you can teach a child, you can teach an adult or whoever is going through something or someone who may be racist, how to deal with it. You know, uh, interestingly enough, I kind of, um, want to, I want to give a shout out to my Jewish upbringing. Um, my grandparents, my grandmother was Jewish, um, and my godparents were Jewish, both survivors of the, of the Holocaust who met on Cyprus and got married in Israel, a brand new country. And in, in, in at least in our Jewish traditions, mm -hmm. um, we did never believed in shying away from difficult conversations. You know, part of the, the, the tradition of avoiding another Holocaust was never forget you talk about it, you are honest about it, you don't let people remember, you keep that in the top of people's minds so they can remember what human beings are capable of and keep a watchful eye out. And I think this is part of my approach to racism also is um, we're not gonna age out of racism. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about it. You cannot get around it, you can't get over it, we must get through it. Mm -hmm. And there was no, I mean, there was no point in my life in any, in any way um, when my godparents didn't talk about what they experienced in the Holocaust because I was too young to take it. Why? Because they're very, very, they were quite young when it happened to them. They had young relatives and nieces and cousins who were killed. No one is so young that they're not, they can't become a victim of anti-Semitism or racism or any of the other isms. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, no one is too young to have this conversation. Children begin uh, um, absorbing the biases of their families at age three. That means that's when they need to start talking about it. Children yeah. notice difference right away. There's nothing wrong with children noticing difference. Mm -hmm. That's okay. If they notice that someone has dark skin, that's okay. Why would you think that's shameful? The only reason you'd think that dark skin noticing dark skin is shameful is if you think there's something wrong about having dark skin. Right. If you see an Asian person with, with narrow eyes, the only reason you'd think that you're not allowed to notice this completely objective fact mm -hmm. is if you think there's something wrong with that. There isn't. Right. It's okay to talk about difference and notice it. I want people to notice different my difference. Mm hmm I'm proud of it. I'm proud of my heritage. Notice it all you want. Let's talk about it. Don't turn it into something you think I should be ashamed of. Right. But let's notice it. Yeah. Uh, we only have a minute or so left, but I want to uh, really quick. I just want to, because this is a big topic, chapter 12, um, talking about racism in the workplace, because we're going back to work tomorrow, right? Before we wrap up this conversation, how can we balance and get through racism in the workplace? Very, very quickly, I will say the standard diversity training that we've been using has been shown uh, through research that it does not work. And in fact, in many cases, that standard diversity training of watching those videos actually increases the likelihood of acts of discrimination and bias. We need to stop treating racism like a knowledge problem. We know racism is wrong. We mm -hmm. need to treat it like a behavior problem. Yeah. Some things are acceptable, some aren't. And frankly, if if companies were doing what they needed to do to create an inclusive environment, we wouldn't need diversity officers. You don't need diversity officers if your company has an inclusive and diverse uh, environment and work habits. So, mm -hmm. yeah. There we have it. Drop smite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where can everybody grab your book? Pretty much <laughs> everywhere. Um, I... I strongly encourage you to support independent bookstores, but you can you can find it pretty much anywhere. And I read the audiobook myself. Yeah, I, I, I got mine from um, Amazon. So and there's, there's the stars on there. It's all great. You can look at reviews and everything is amazing. And, and this speaks for itself as a review right here. I cannot wait. This has been a phenomenal um, eye opening, much needed conversation. I hope that you get the book. And uh, we have to speak about racism and we have to speak about it everywhere. Uh, Celeste, thank you so much. And I'm so thank honored you for doing this. Project. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much. Y'all have a great night. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Well, Persia, really quick, I just want to echo what you said. This was a, a tremendously impactful conversation. So yeah. very, very uh, uh, thankful that we were able to have you guys um, here with the Prats of Celeste, Persia. Uh, thank you for coming out and joining us and making this uh, become a reality. And thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. If, if you haven't uh, already, please fill out the program survey that was posted earlier uh, in the comments. Your input lets us know that we're, what we're doing is, uh, you know, good for Baltimore and what you would like to see uh, in the future. So um, please take the time to fill that out. Thank you to the hearing and speech agency for providing accessibility for tonight's event. And um, again, Celeste, Persia, thank you so much. Everyone stay safe, take care, and have a good evening. Good night. See ya. Good night.